Thank you very much. Um, I'm the one with the big microphone, so that means I'm in charge. Um, but we've got a fantastic lineup of panelists here for you, um, and we're here to talk about food, um, which is obviously such a basic issue that most of us are very fortunate not to have to think about it day to day. Um, but obviously, for huge swathes of the world, um, it's a massively pressing issue um, and is going to become more so. I'm Fiona Harvey, I'm the Environment Correspondent for the Guardian newspaper, and I'm going to introduce Cristiano Figueres uh, from Mission 2020. Cristiano, of course, was uh, the UN's top official on climate change, who saw through the Paris Agreement in 2015. It's a massive achievement. Uh, we've also got Sir Richard Sheriff, and he's a partner at Strategia uh, Consulting, um, who's here to, to bring us his perspective. And we've got Robert Hopp, uh, who's Director of Innovation at the World Food Programme in Rome, um, but was originally, uh, as he's told me, a Canadian farm kid. So he brings that perspective as well. Um, so I'd like to start by asking, well, as we've just said, food, the most basic thing in anyone's life. We have a planet at the moment, we have seven and a half billion people. Uh, by 2050, we will have somewhere between nine billion and perhaps 10 or even 12 billion people, according to UN estimates. Um, we're not doing terribly well at feeding everyone at the moment. We also have the pressing problem of climate change. We recently had an IPCC uh, report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, warning of the dire consequences if we continue uh, our way on our fossil fuel driven path. Um, so we have a lot of threats to our food supply. Um, how are we going to feed all of those people uh, in the coming years? Christiane. Um, well, thanks very much, Fiona. Always good to, to see you, and thank you to the two of you. Um, I think it's important to remember that the challenge of food um, is actually at the nexus of four trends that we're seeing as a globe. First, there is population uh, explosion. We're going up to 9 billion brothers and sisters, hence more food necessary. Secondly, with respect to food, we also, as we produce this differently, because we will have to, we have to ensure that the two billion people who are currently deriving their income from food production, mostly poor women in developing countries, do not lose their income but have some alternative income or if they're going to stay in food. So that's the second nexus. The third nexus is this exploding urbanization trend that we see where very soon three quarters of the world population is going to be living in cities. And so how do you get food from where it is traditionally um, produced in the rural areas, how do you get it to the urban areas? And then there's climate, as though we didn't have enough challenges for food, right? And the climate um, relationship with food is actually a closed cycle, because unless we address climate in a timely way, we will have increased food insecurity, in particular in vulnerable countries. And conversely, unless we're able to manage land properly, we will be exacerbating climate change. So that's a, f a closed loop um, relationship there. So there are three challenges in those, that nexus, there are at least three challenges that we have to address. The first is how do we produce food for the future? And that is a whole family of issues, but it certainly has to do with much better, from an ecological point of view, much more sustainable agriculture. It has to do with low till. It has to do with taking advantage of both horizontal and vertical agriculture. So that's the first is the how. The second is what are we producing? And here are the astonishing facts. 75% of the land area on the world is inhabitable, 25 is not. 50% of that is actually devoted to food production. And 80% of that is devoted to livestock. So that is completely inefficient, in addition to the fact that it's really bad for our health. So A, what we produce and what we eat has got to change. We have to move over to plant-based diets. And the third very big issue is 
food waste. And food waste is not just in your kitchen and my kitchen, it's all the way from the farm to the fork. At every step in the value chain, there is completely irresponsible food waste. So, Fiona, I think that what we have done up until now has just not given us any results. So I wanted to put forward three provocative ideas that most people will say, okay, she's completely nuts. But I think we have to not just think out of the box, we have to think without a box. So for how we produce, one of the things that we have to do is to restore degraded lands and make them productive. So what would happen if we actually asked the fossil fuel companies who have to bring down their emissions and have to do it through their operations, reducing methane, et cetera, et cetera, and moving over to renewable energy. But in, admission, in addition to that, they could actually finance the reforestation and restoration of degraded lands that we have in the world. A lot of problems with that idea, but let's think out of the box. Secondly, for food waste, what would happen if restaurants 10, 15 years from now would follow the same policy that they're following on smoking? You want to smoke in a restaurant, you go outside. It's snowing, it's, it's raining, it doesn't matter, you go outside. Oh, so now, 10 to 15 years from now, you want to eat meat in a restaurant, you go outside. Because inside the restaurant, we're not feeding you meat. Very, very provocative idea, but why not? It is possible we did it with smoking, equally bad for our health. Why don't we do it with meat? And on food waste, why don't we ask the fertilizer companies of the world, of which there are only a few very large ones, to take a look at food waste? And the food that we waste should actually go back into the soil. We have to put the carbon back into the soil. So instead of wasting the food, can the fertilizers of companies actually put their brains on how are they gonna gather the food that is wasted after we have reduced food waste throughout the whole value chain and actually create fertilizer, organic fertilizer out of food waste. Three provocative, very contentious ideas. But frankly, we're not doing very well with what we're doing right now. Business as usual ain't doing it, so let's do something unusual. Well, I think that's, uh, well, that is provocative. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, the food waste problem in particular, um, some of it is entirely avoidable um, mm -hmm. using technology that we already have. Some of it, there is simply no excuse. Um, so Richard, I'd like to bring you in at this point. I mean, how do you see the problem? I'd like to say what a stimulating and thought-provoking uh, intervention we just had from, uh, from Christiana. I mean, I come at it from a, a very different angle, and, and perhaps what uh, Fiona um, might have added is that my background before I became a, uh, a risk management consultant was that for 37 years I was a professional soldier. My last job was NATO's deputy strategic commander. So I look at, the, I look at some of the challenges of, of, of feeding the world from the perspective of the confluence of security, stability, and prosperity. Uh, and ultimately, uh, if we are to feed the world, it's about generating and sharing prosperity. Um, and if you look at the, the reality, look at South Yemen at the moment, the fact is that we have the world's largest humanitarian disaster, the consequence of conflict. Um, where there is conflict, there is all too often starvation. Um, so it's about creating security, uh, because from security flows stability and ultimately prosperity. Now, I know that is easier said than done, but it highlights a number of things. First and foremost, I think it highlights the importance of international organizations. Uh, organizations like the United Nations, like the European Union, like NATO, set up in the mid 20th century by men and women who were determined never to repeat the carnage of the first half of the 20th century. And of course, many of those, uh, some of those international, international organizations, I would say all three of them, particularly the UN and particularly the EU, are under strain in a way they have not been under strain for some 70 decades since they were set up. So the importance of international institutions. I would also highlight that it is only through international effort that the, the that fragile and failing states, all too often unable to feed their own populations, uh, can be made stable and more stable, because that way uh, prosperity and the seeds of prosperity can generate. 
And the only way to achieve that, in my view, is through the most comprehensive and wide capacity building. Building administrations, building ministries with uh, reducing corruption, health, education, free and open media, of course, as a place for security forces, professional armed forces as a contribution to state stability, uncorrupt police forces. Uh, and this requires not only an international effort, but I would also say there's a part here for the private sector. Uh, because ultimately, if the private sector has a, has a role to play, but it's, got, it's, 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 it's in its own interest. I mean, if you are a mining company and you're, you're looking to operate uh, in a conflict-strewn country in southern Africa or sub-Saharan Africa, perhaps, it's absolutely in your commercial interest to ensure your investment is protected through stability. Uh, so I come back to the importance of stability. I come back to the importance of prosperity and to effectively uh, what Adam Smith, the, uh, the father, in many ways would describe his wealth of nations as the father of capital, described as the engine of prosperity in its own way. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, and Robert, if I can bring you in at this point, you've worked at the World Food Programme for nearly 20 years. What gives you hope for the next 20? Yeah, how great question. And we really are tackling all the issues in the world on this panel. So it's really, this is great. We're going to get, we're going to get it fixed. Um, let me start with the problem again, back to where you started, Fiona, which is there are still 821 million people affected by hunger globally right now. So before we even talk about 9 billion people in 2050 or whatever, we've got to take care of this problem now. The good news, in a sense, is that we actually produce enough food globally to feed all those people right now. So we have a major distribution problem, for one thing. Um, food waste is a major problem, and it's not only in the kind of developed world where overconsumption is driving that. It's actually uh, even a bigger issue in the developing world where we have problems for when food is produced, up to 40% can be wasted by the time it gets to market. And that's because there is inadequate post-harvest storage, uh, there are inefficiencies in the supply chain somehow. It, it's just spoilage and, and wastage in that sense. It's not overconsumption. But what's, it is ironic that about one-third to 40% of the food in the developing world is wasted, and about a third in the developed countries uh, is wasted as well. So this is a, 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 a major problem that we have to address. Now, as I mentioned, there's enough food right now but we can actually become more productive, and we can become better at distributing, and we can also change our behavior. And that's kind of the way I would break it down. And I have a lot of hope for the future because I think that we can, and you know, we're, we're here at Web Summit, we're talking about a lot of uh, technologies and things that are able to kind of impact all parts of life. There are a lot of things that we can do in the area of production. There has been a revolution in agriculture in the developed world over the last 10 years with precision farming enabled by GPS and artificial intelligence powered systems and satellite imagery and so on. I think we can find ways to bridge those business models and bring them to the small farmer, those nearly 2 billion people living in small farmer households. I also think we can do a lot when it comes to improving the efficiency of food systems, markets, supply chain, all of that, that chain to getting to market, we can apply, uh, for example, um, I mean, there's people even talking about taking drones to pick up uh, food at farm site and taking it to a market so that we avoid the problems of the inefficient infrastructure that's in places. Um, there's all sorts of things we can do around digital marketplaces, linking small farmers to buyers digitally so that they can avoid the worst inefficiencies. And we're experimenting that with that right now at the World Food Programme. And then consumer behavior, it, it needs to change. And I think that there are technological ways that we can address some of that as well. I mean, it's, it's a very human cultural problem, and so I don't want to underestimate that. But look at how our behavior changes when we interface with technologies of different kinds that come along. We can look at how we can change behaviors, and we can look at what, if, what we can do in terms of things like meat substitutes and, and new kinds of uh, products as well. So I, I hold out a lot of hope for the future when it comes to uh, addressing those problems across the value chain. Thank you. And what about water? Because uh, yeah. so much of the, the water that's used by people, uh, most of it actually goes on, on agriculture. Do we have a water problem as well as food? And can we innovate our way out of that? So, well, um, 
as long as we're tackling all the problems of the world, let's look at water. Um, water is a major problem, um, of course, and, and it's, it's a problem in terms of uh, scarcity of water in certain places. So uh, that's where uh, I think we mentioned vertical farming or uh, there are some very soil uh, or sorry, uh, water efficient farming techniques that exist out there. We're experimenting with hydroponics, um, using hydroponics in refugee camps, for example. Uh, very space constrained environment, vertical stacking, that sort of thing has a lot of uh, promise to it. But then there is the issue of water in terms of our oceans. Um, and that is something where we absolutely need to apply the same kind of thinking that I've just talked about with agriculture, but to the, the, the aquatic value chain. Um, and one thing I didn't mention or didn't emphasize before, but I think is valid in both land agriculture as well as aquaculture, is the importance of having data. Because the more data we have and then the more platforms we have to, to address that data, we can build different solutions, different business models out of the, the, the data sources that are coming our way. And, and I, I see this coming with the ubiquitousness of satellite images and then there's drones that are able to take assessment images and there are uh, low cost sensors that can be put in ground or water. These things will be able to tell us a lot more about what's going on and design very efficient systems. And if I can come in on that, because yeah. we're, we're talking about the relationship between food and climate, and, and water clearly sits right there, right? Because what climate change is doing is it's disrupting the otherwise previously stable hydrological cycle in the world, and in particular disrupting hydrological cycles in regions. So while 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, you had belts around the planet that were basically the agricultural belts of the planet, that's shifting shifting because those agricultural belts are not getting the moisture, the precipitation that they used to. The, um, the precipitation is moving to other areas. So you have several what we call adaptive technologies that need to be developed. First, you need to develop seeds and plants that are more resistant to drought so that you can continue cultivating food in the areas that were there. But you also need to figure out that there's going to be a shift in the geography of food production, in fact, even maybe in crops. Um, and so how do you not perceive the world as a victim to that, but rather how do you in, how do you stay one step ahead and understand that that could actually bring some advantages if we plan for it ahead of time? Um, and I think, you know, the, the fact that, um, that Johannesburg was about to run out of water in April, I think, you know, made all the newspapers of the world, uh, they were about to run out of water because they had three years, three years of drought. They had not prepared for that. So preparing for that kind of disruption in the hydrological cycle is going to be absolutely critical. Thank you. Um, and also on the question of, of climate change, which you, you, you just mentioned, you talked about some of the, the problems of agriculture producing greenhouse gas emissions and, and so on. Um, do we all need to become vegetarian? Yes. As some people are saying, right, okay. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Is yes, I mean, no, I gave you the stats, right? 75% of the land is habitable by humans, 50% of that is devoted to food production, and 80% of the land that we have for food production is devoted to creatures, right? To livestock, to say nothing of the water that is necessary for that. And consuming meat is a bad for the planet because of all of the GHG emissions, because it's it has embedded deforestation, but it's also really bad for our body. So if we want to make the planet sick and if we want to make ourselves sick, continue to eat meat. If you want to be a healthier planet and a healthy human, vegetarian. Vegan if you can do it. Okay, thank you. Don. So Richard, can I bring you in there? I mean, with your knowledge of, of management. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of, of managing and human behavior, do you think it's possible that we will go the way that Christiana advocates? I think anything is possible if we put our will to it. Yes. I mean, I would ask, can we eat game? <laughs> what, uh, venison, and, venison and wild boar, which are natural. I'll leave that to you to, to think about it. But if I may just come up with two final points, as it were. One is the importance of the United Nations. Uh, and the importance of that UN doctrine, right to protect, which has been 
rather forgotten about, um, and I think it's a, an important thing that we need to, an important point we need to remember. The other point I would just highlight as a sort of finale is beware of, of aid agencies, beware of aid charities. I'm, I'm born and brought up in Kenya, and I remember driving across the, driving the Trans-Africa Highway uh, to where I was born some years ago. Villages on the way, full of food. Meanwhile, there was a drought in northern Kenya, and what was happening? Uh, many of the aid, aid charities were calling for money from, 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 from people in the West to pour money in. Actually, it was about infrastructure, it's about transport, it's about lack of corruption, because much of the money that was put into uh, metal, the Trans-African Highway, had probably ended up in the pockets of corrupt officials and ministers. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we've just got a couple of minutes left, so if I could just ask all the panelists, um, we're talking here about solutions um, to the world problem, and you're here at a tech summit. What technology, te technology do you think is absolutely vital that we harness in the next few years? Robert, I'll go to you first. Yeah, and, and I've, already, I've already mentioned several of those, but I, I would sort of cast it in terms, I talked a lot about data. Um, I think that there are a lot of different kinds of platforms and technologies that can be built with data as a foundation. So even uh, going to something Christiana said about um, you know, how the, the climate patterns are changing, uh, we can build insurance or microinsurance programs and, and products uh, to help farmers sort of survive the, the drought cycles and things like that. Uh, the World Bank and, and the United Nations with Amazon, uh, Google and Microsoft are working on a famine action mechanism to predict famine earlier out so that we can put things in place and put financing in place early on because that taking early action is going to save a lot of uh, money and food later on. So I would um, say uh, all sorts of different platforms, data combined with artificial intelligence, all along that value chain. Thank you very much. Uh, building on that, the key is agility and quick decision making. And the key here is not only to harness the data, uh, but to funnel it into a single source of truth, to allow for decision makers to make the rapid decisions. Because there's so much out there, but it's just a question of making sense of it. So if technology can give us that ability to harness data into a single source of truth, then it will be serving the world well. Thank you very much. So I think we've heard already um, some of the technologies that are already there. We will be developing many more technologies, but structurally, I think it's helpful to think about it as basically the food problem is resource inefficiency. It is because we're being completely inefficient in our supply of food. We're being completely inefficient in our, de uh, in our demand for food. So supply and demand are not being met at an optimal. And we're being completely inefficient in transport and distribution. So all technologies that look at the inefficiencies and pulling the inefficiencies out to make food production much more efficient between supply and demand and transport and distribution are actually the, the uh, technologies that we need pronto. Thank you very much. And I think we've got experts in efficiency in this audience, so I hope that they're going to take that home today. Thank you all. Thank you very much for an excellent panel. Thank you, panelists. <laughs>